Welcome to Tech Donations for Libraries. I'm your host Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup's offices in San Francisco. And I will be facilitating today's event. I've been with TechSoup for six and a half years, and I have worked on both the TechSoup.org side and a little bit on the TechSoup for Libraries side. Um, prior to coming to TechSoup, I worked for three small nonprofits, so I come to this with more of a nonprofit background. But a couple of our other presenters here today have very library-specific expertise that they'll be bringing to the program. So we hope that you'll feel served. And like I said, feel free to ask questions throughout, and we'll do our best to answer them. Also joining us today is Ginny Mees. She is a Senior Content Curator here at TechSoup, and she also helps run TechSoup for Libraries. Before coming to TechSoup, Ginny was a Senior Editor for PC World. She covered mobile phones as well as consumer advocacy issues for both website and print magazines. And she also just got her Master's of – what was it? Library. Help me out. <laughs> Master's of Library and Information Sciences, MLIS from San Jose State. Thank you for clarifying. I knew it was something like that. I always mess up which, the, which degrees are which. But she is uh, you know, very involved in helping run the TechSoup for Libraries program here at TechSoup and is a library aficionado on our end. So we're happy to have her joining us. Also on today's call is Tommy Netsband or Thomas Netsband. He is a Qualification and Eligibility Specialist here at TechSoup, and he specializes in library qualifications for the donation programs and products and services that are available through our programs. He's also an avid snorkeler and spends most of his time making me jealous while on vacation in Hawaii. You'll also see on the back end, assisting with chat, Ali Bezdikian, who is an interactive events and video producer here at TechSoup. And she will be there to help answer your questions, flag them for follow-up. And in general, she helps run our webinar program and create interactive videos. So if you have any questions about those topics, feel free to reach out to her. A quick look at today's agenda. We will be doing an introduction to TechSoup and TechSoup for Libraries for those of you who aren't already familiar with us. We'll try and do it pretty quickly, but we want to make sure that you're aware of the variety of resources that we try to make available uh, through our work to help assist you in yours and in serving your own communities. So then we'll have an opportunity for you to vote and tell us what you want to spend time on in this hour. And we want to make sure that you walk away feeling like you've gotten the answers that you need to move forward with getting donations and accessing technology uh, as much as we can make available through our programs. Then we'll, we'll hopefully, as a result of your poll, we'll spend some time talking about the tech donations and resources, how you can engage, how you can access community resources, and share your own expertise as well as getting those donations. We'll have time for Q&A a bit throughout, but we'll also save some time toward the end for more questions and answers. So a quick review of TechSoup. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are working toward the day when every nonprofit and library on the planet has access to technology knowledge and resources to operate at their full potential. And in doing that, we've been around since 1987, serving more than 200,000 charitable organizations in more than 60 countries around the world. This includes nonprofits, libraries, foundations, uh, community centers, all kinds of different organizations that we reach out to. And one of the specific areas that we target are public libraries. You can find out more about our programs at TechSoup.org, which we'll visit live in a few minutes. But first I want to have Ginny come on and talk to us a little bit about the resources you can find at TechSoup for Libraries. So I have some screenshots in here, but I'd love it if she would go ahead and share her screen and show us around a little bit quickly of what we can find on TechSoupForLibraries.org. Thanks Becky. So I'm just going to share right now. Share my whole desk. Or I guess I can share Firefox. Okay. And go ahead and let us know in the audio if anything um, takes a long time to render, or if you need us to slow down. Somebody just chatted in that they're hearing an echo. And if you're hearing an echo, it may mean that you're logged in more than once, and you might need to close one instance of ReadyTalk for that echo to go away. Um, so she's going to go ahead and show her desktop here of what TechSoupForLibraries.org looks like, and let us know if for some reason you're not able to see it. Okay, so you should be seeing the TechSoup for Libraries homepage. <clears throat> 
And um, as you can see, we have the latest blog post on the home page, so you can always see you know, what, what we're talking about, what topics we're exploring um, right there. And then underneath us, Underneath that is our Twitter feed. Uh, if you don't follow us on Twitter already, I highly recommend it. We're not going to blast you with a lot of advertisements, just sharing information and the most interesting stories in technology about public libraries. Uh, so let's go to our spotlight. And taking a little while to load. Here we go. So our library spotlights are longer form, in-depth interviews with librarians from around the country, uh, usually focused on some sort of technology topic. This one was about publicity and marketing and getting funding through uh, this librarian needed to get funding. And she teamed up with a local newspaper and has like a weekly column where she talks about what's going on in the library. So we do these in-depth interviews. We talk about, um, you know, talk to them about how they did these programs. We talk about what technology they use, what they cover. We try to get a lot of photos, and we encourage you, you librarians, to tell us what you are up to at your library. Uh, we want to know because librarians, in my experience, I love learning from other librarians. I love hearing what other people are doing and sharing that information. And we want to act as sort of like the medium for you guys to share information with each other. And so I'm just going to go all the way down to here where you can tell us about your library. So this little get in touch form, you can just fill it out, tell us what you're up to, we'll get in touch with you, and you know, we'll either interview you for a library spotlight, or if you have like an idea for a webinar, we'd just love to chat with you. So always tell us what you're doing, keep in touch with us, either via this get in touch form, or with us on Twitter, or you can even email me, any, any way you want, want to tell us what your library is up to. So I'm going to show you our blog. And this is really where we keep the most up-to-date news about the, you know, what's going on in the library technology world, as well as what's new on TechSoup and TechSoup for Libraries. And so our most recent blog post is this awesome quick guide to making online tutorial videos for e-readers. And this was um, somebody that we met at the California Library Association's <laughs> conference. And we loved her project idea, and we were just like, can you please blog for us? Share your information. And so she shared this really handy how-to. Um, and you know, that's another way. If you have like a blog idea, contact us. Let us know, and we'd love to help you share it with the world. So here's another blog that we had um, on e-crafts, which was really a fun before the holidays type blog. Um, so let's see. I'm going to move on to webinars and events. This is just our little handy calendar. Um, as you can see, we have a webinar coming up on January 21st on engaging volunteers as tech trainers in public libraries. We've got a guest speaker from Denver Public Library as well as a, another librarian that just joined on, um, I believe, from Vermont, um, from a smaller rural library. So that will be a really great one. I highly recommend that you register. But if you can't make our webinars, we have this whole event archive. And you can find a huge backlog of um, TechSoup for Libraries webinars, as well as TechSoup webinars that libraries would be interested in. So keep this bookmarked because um, you know we can't always we have really busy schedules we can't always make webinars on you know the dates that they're scheduled but you can always watch an archive. So let's see let's go back to the home page. Now if you're not signed up for our newsletter I think that's one of the best ways to stay on top of what's happening at TechSoup for Libraries as well as any new products that we have for libraries. Um, it's really a low maintenance newsletter because it only comes once a month. I believe it's the third Tuesday of every month and I write it <laughs> so you know it's it's just wonderful. I'm just kidding. But it is it is really informative and if you're wondering, you know, when something's coming back in stock or wondering, you know, what we're talking about over here at TechSoup for Libraries, it's just a really easy way to scan through and, and get the, the lowdown in your inbox. Um, and then I'll just go quickly to the cookbooks. Now this is something that um, 
is sort of the, the backbone, the foundation of what TechSuper Libraries was built on. These are guides on tech planning, um, both for larger public libraries and as well as there's a, a one particularly for small and rural libraries. Uh, we haven't really been keeping these up to date so much, um, but you know they're they're pretty evergreen and just great quick references. Something that you can you know quickly reference and go back to, um, and you know they're PDFs so you can download them, save them on your computer. Really helpful little guides. I'll go back to the home page. So that's pretty much it. I mean, you know it's it's a great um, place to come to when you just really want to find out you know, what other libraries are doing, or if you have like a tech idea that you want to share with other libraries, we're always happy to help you share that out with the world. Great. Thanks so much for that, Ginny. And, you know, Ginny referenced uh, kind of the backbone being the cookbooks. And uh, just to give a little history quickly, um, you know, this project, you may not have heard of it as TechSoup for Libraries, but you may have heard of it as the Maintain IT Project, which was an initiative funded by the Gates Foundation's um, Libraries Program or Library Initiative. And since then, it evolved into TechSoup for Libraries, and we've also you know, partnered to have funding around the BTOP rollout and working on broadband technology and working on helping set and get information out about the EDGE initiative, and we've had partnerships with Web Junction and OCLC. You know, so we've worked on this for many years at this point around a um, you know, variety of topics, helping, hoping to help libraries with their technology as well as helping them uh, better serve their communities with public computing access and public, uh, public computing public broadband access and things like that. So you know, this is a, a really big part of what we do here at TechSoup, and we hope that you find it useful. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and just take us back to the slide deck because I'd like at this point to have you participate in a little bit of interactivity here and answering a couple of poll questions for us. We know when you registered you answered a couple of questions, but this will help give us an idea of who here on the line is already registered with TechSoup, who doesn't know, or who for sure isn't. Uh, because this will help guide us through the next portion of this webinar that you will be helping to direct with your votes here in just a moment. So we have about 90 people or so on the line at the moment. And so I'm going to give just a few more seconds so that everybody has a chance to click on one of those radio buttons on their screen. And this will help give us a little bit of information on how we can best serve your needs today. And we know you can't see what's coming into the chat window, and so if there are things that you share that are useful, we'll also share those back out with the rest of the participants so they can hear your advice or your tips or your comments. Uh, Lee asks right now, uh, is TechSoup open to school libraries as well or just public libraries? And we primarily focus on public libraries, and they have to be uh, listed in the IMLS database. You can also access Tech to TechSoup's donations if you are 501c3 friends of a library. So there's a variety of ways that we help connect with libraries. Our content may be just as applicable to school library as a public library, but the donation programs are somewhat restricted because our partners set the restrictions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, just to look at the results of this poll, about 60% of you, 63% are already registered, and, and total around uh, my math skills, 36% are either not or not sure. So that's really helpful to know that two-thirds of you are already registered with TechSoup. So you are probably somewhat familiar with our programs, which is great. One other question, and this is really to get your input on how you'd most like to spend the rest of today's webinar. We want this to be useful for you, so we figure the best way to make it so is to let you vote on it. So tell us what you would most like to cover today. And if there's something not on this list, feel free to chat it into us in the chat window. So would you like to hear more about the benefits of joining TechSoup if you're not already a, a member? Uh, do you want to go through the process of how to join and register your library? Do you want to talk about eligibility and restrictions and kind of why some programs are open to you and others aren't? Do you want to spend time on actually going step-by-step step through how to request products? 
Um, do you want to see more about our events and webinars? Do you want to spend more time looking at the library spotlights that Ginny briefly highlighted? Um, a couple of them, but there are pages and pages of them going back uh, I'd say six, seven years. Uh, so lots and lots of great expertise that you guys, your communities, have shared with us. And that's really how the Maintain IT project started was to get libraries to share expertise with one another and that we were just helping to provide the platform to do that. And we still hope to do that with our Spotlights. Um, do you want to talk more about those opportunities to share your expertise? Like I said, Ginny already showed kind of where to submit that form. You can also email, I think it's just libraries at TechSoupForLibraries.org uh, with your comments. Or uh, if you want a guest blog or be a webinar presenter on a topic, you can always email and say, hey, I think it would be great for this. Uh, do you want to talk about specific donation programs? And if you've responded to that one, go ahead and chat into the window which donation programs you're most interested in having us cover. And then if there's something else you'd like us to cover, feel free to chat into us. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in. I'm going to go ahead and show the results right now. Uh, it looks like nearly 70% of you want to spend time on how to request products. That's great. So we will do that. And we'll try to make some of those sample requests, uh, products that you want us to spend time talking about. So if you want to chat into us to let us know about the specific donation programs you're interested in, we can talk about that because that's 60% of you want to know about specific programs. That's, this is really great input for us. And we know we could have you vote on this before the webinar, but since not everybody shows up on the day of the event, we find it really useful to have you do it and let us know during the event so that we're all in it together in making these decisions. And then the third thing on the list, third most popular is eligibility and restrictions. So I'm sure we'll be able to get through a few of these. And Sue makes a good point here in the chat asking what specific donation programs are available. So what ones are there to pick from? So we'll go ahead and look at that. And I think that's actually a great place to start. So I'm going to go ahead and get my page set up to share TechSoup.org. So this will take just a moment. I won't be able to see your chat questions while, and comments while I'm sharing my desktop, but know that we have people here flagging them, and we'll take a couple of breaks uh, to look at those while I'm sharing my desktop. So let me go ahead and get that set up. It should take just a moment for it to come up. And hopefully you'll be seeing my desktop on your screen momentarily. You should be seeing TechSoup.org, our landing page of our donation program site. If you're not, go ahead and let us know, and we can give it a few more seconds. So at the TechSoup.org site, since about two-thirds of you are already members, you may be familiar, but you may not have actually requested donations yourself, or it may be a different person on staff that has requested donations, or somebody in the past, and you know you're signed up, but you don't know how to do it. So we can spend a little bit of time just getting oriented with the site. I'll try and make this really quick. So obviously TechSoup.org. Up here in the top left is where you can subscribe to our newsletters. We have three that we think are um, really great for different purposes. So one is called By the Cup, and it's a weekly newsletter that includes uh, themes, around, you know, so it might have a theme on mobile technologies, and another theme might be on securing your data, and another theme might be on a new product that's launched. And that comes out once a week. Another of our newsletters is the New Product Alert, and that one comes out once a month typically, and that is really primarily highlighting just what new products have launched each month. It is exactly what it sounds like. It alerts you to, hey, there's a new thing. So you can see on our home page right now, brand new Norton 2015. So that would be in the new product alert. Um, and then we also have the TechSoup for Libraries newsletter that Ginny mentioned is a once a month newsletter, the third Wednesday of the month, Tuesday of the month, Wednesday of the month, Tuesday of the month, thank you, um, that you can get that newsletter. and that's specifically looking at resources and compiling resources and content and products that we think are of interest to public libraries. So I would recommend subscribing to any of those or all of those. 
Uh, it's the best way to keep in touch with what programs are available, and what new content is being created, and what new libraries are being spotlighted. You might see one of your friends uh, has been interviewed and spotlighted. So it's a great place to keep in touch with library technology in general. Um, most of our programs on TechSoup.org are geared toward organizations and libraries in the United States. If you are joining us from outside the United States, I would recommend visiting this drop-down and seeing if your country is on this list and going to that local site for donation information. Uh, so if you are in Canada, we have a partner in Canada that does TechSoup Canada, and they have donation programs that are specific to organizations in that country. So just keep that in mind. Um, up here, log in, join. As an individual, you join TechSoup. So you might have signed up as gene at DuluthLibrary.org <laughs> or .gov. Um, but that doesn't actually register your library. So you want to make sure that you are both joined as an individual and that your library is registered. And you can do that through these links up here at the top right. You can also do them in this big box here on the right side where it gives you all the steps to joining where you sign up as an individual member, you register or associate yourself to an existing organization. So you can look up your organization either by EIN number or to see if your library is in the IMLS database and maybe it's already registered with us. You can check that here. And if it's not, then you can go ahead and register. And then you get to start requesting products and services. So it's really somewhat simple. It seems very simple on paper here. Um, but really consider it like a grant fulfillment process because it's, it's not equivalent to going to Amazon and requesting a product and getting it at your doorstep two days later. Um, most of the programs on our site are electronically delivered if it's a software program. So just be aware that you'll get an email that has that product uh, license in it or may have a link to where you install and download. But it still has to go through the process of approving that you are actually eligible for that donation. And the eligibility, which was on this list uh, of things that you guys wanted to cover, eligibility is really determined by our donor partners. So. If you look over here in this Get Products and Services drop-down, you can browse by a variety of different ways. So we can browse by donor or provider, by category or solution, by organization type. You, know, you can see there's a bunch. But by donor or provider, you can see that there are a lot of different providers here. So each one of these providers gets to say, you know, I really want to donate my products to organizations, serving homeless communities, low-income housing, youth services, and public libraries. And they need to have a budget of less than $100,000 a year or whatever they, whatever they want. <laughs> they can set those criteria. So you'll find that you may be eligible for Microsoft donation, but you may not be eligible for um, Donor Perfect or whatever example here. So each of these donor partners gets to set that eligibility. And as TechSoup, I can say pretty confidently that we are always working to try and expand the availability and eligibility of our programs to the widest swath of public serving organizations out there. So we would love to see donations widely available to public libraries, widely available to school libraries and academic libraries. Now, that's not always the case though because we're negotiating with these donor partners to get them to give these donations out, and they don't always want to. So we, we work really hard to try and expand those. So if something's not available to you now, signing up for those newsletters can really help uh, be the first thing to let you know when, hey, all of a sudden we've gotten such and such donor to open up to libraries. So I would recommend coming back to check if you've been uh, told that you're not eligible for something in the past, definitely check again. And there is a great way to find out what you are eligible to request. And it, down here on this left side it's called Check Your Eligibility. And it's a little quiz that you can go ahead and click on. And with this little quiz, you can find out really quickly. Um, you, know, you can check off 
that you are a 501c3 library, a public library without a C3 status, a nonprofit C3, if you're none of the above. So for the purposes of this event, we'll do a U.S. public library without C3 status, since most public libraries um, are not uh, C3. You can say our organization is located in – we'll go with Arizona today. Um, and then you can say the following type, organization type, best fits my organization's mission. And public libraries often are kind of put into a very specific org type, and that's because the IRS has a definition of codes that they use, and that's what our system works on. They're called the NTEE codes. And so in this case, you don't have a big drop-down to choose from. And so you can select your your org's mission. It's non-501c3 if it's a public library. If you're friends of a library and you have a C3 status, definitely fill it out as a C3. And then we can say our organization's annual operating budget is we'll say $250,000. And I'll click to check eligibility. And at this point it comes up with a whole list of programs that my library is most likely eligible to be able to request donations and have them fulfilled. So you know, if I came here for you know, I do need a new back office accounting software because our municipality has decided they don't want to do it for us anymore. Um, I can come here and I can get QuickBooks now. Yay! I can look at the Microsoft program and maybe I need new operating systems for my bank of public computing machines. Or Maybe I want um, a new deep freeze-like program, which uh, Horizon Data Systems is, which I'm not actually seeing on here, so I'll have to find where that has disappeared to. Um, or maybe I need a new uh, public training program, like Bytes of Learning, which is a keyboard program that help, you, know, you can use in a classroom setting to teach people how to type. Or maybe I need trainings available to my patrons, and atomic training courses are available for donation. So there are a lot of different things in here that you may have no idea what they are. They might be totally unfamiliar to you. Um, but you can see there's a lot of different donations that are in our system that this library that I just created from thin air, <laughs> as an example, is eligible to receive. Reading Eggs, which is a reading program. So lots of great tools. Uh, the tool that we're using today, ReadyTalk, that's available, ReadyTalk webinar programs. So this is a great place to start if you're not sure. If you've done this process and you're logged in, I'm going to go ahead and log in since folks wanted to look at how to actually request products. And I'm just going to use my regular login, which has a bunch of different accounts associated with it. And so it automatically up here shows that, hi, B. Wiegand at TechSoup, that's me. Uh, so when you log in, it should be something that you recognize. And if you request donations for more than just your uh, one branch or your one location, um, or if maybe you're a tech consultant who requests donations on behalf of a bunch of libraries or a bunch of organizations, make sure that you see that you're representing the organization that you want to be up here in this left uh, upper left side. And I've already got some stuff in my cart that I'd requested, and I just haven't finished that request. But this is what it looks like, pretty much the same that, as what it looked like before I was logged in, except now that I see that it, it identifies me. And I can go ahead and browse around. And so one place that I'd love to make sure people know about on the TechSoup.org site is browsing by organization type you can go to a page that's specifically set up for libraries to show you the different types of programs that are most popular among libraries who request. And it's just TechSoup.org slash libraries. And this is kind of a companion to our TechSoup for Libraries site, but this is on the main TechSoup.org site. And again, it points people to the check eligibility quiz right at the top, a couple of articles that we've written that, you know, highlights what TechSoup offers to libraries, some nice testimonials from librarians who have written us about the benefits of, of becoming part of TechSoup. 
Joining TechSoup is totally free. There is no cost to be a member. Um, and whether you request donations or not, you can always read and comment on blog posts and participate in our forums, ask questions. All of those things are totally open to you whether you are affiliated with an organization or not. But you can see related content over here, so what TechSoup offers libraries. We also have this Public Computing Resource Center. So if you need information about setting up your own uh, public computing center, or you, know, you want to read something about thin clients versus uh, individual computer setups, this is the place to find some of that. It's got great content that coordinates with a lot of uh, different topics here. And you can see comments in our community forums. Um, you know, this from our community, a quick guide to making online tutorial videos that Ginny mentioned. And so this has this is feeding in from the TechSoup for Libraries.org blog. Um, so you can find all of this in one place. We also have content that's coming from the TechSoup blog, TechSoup.org blog, that highlights um, content that we think is relevant to libraries. So teaching online safety, how to build a curriculum for that and how to teach your community how to stay safe online. Um, and then you know, highlights and spotlights of libraries that we think are just doing really fantastic work and um, that are sharing their success with us about how technology has helped enable them to better serve their community. Also you can see related webinars. So one we did recently was on public tech instruction, so how to help people with online job searches. So us having experts who do this uh, on a monthly basis or weekly basis and teaching courses on online job search assistance. We try to make that content really available and, and easy to find for you. In addition, in the Center section you'll see the top programs for this organization type. So we're on the Libraries page. So what we've found is that these are the programs that libraries that come to TechSoup and get donations are most often requesting. So they're most often requesting Microsoft donations, Intuit, which just opened up to libraries in October, I think. Um, so again, we're always working to expand the availability of some of these donation programs to extend them to libraries. Symantec, which now offers um, their newest product is a combination of Norton security products just in one bundle, which is pretty fantastic. And we'll be doing a webinar on that next Thursday if you're interested in learning more about the new Symantec products and our Refurbished Computer Initiative, which is bringing business grade refurbished computers, um, tablets, laptops, desktops to nonprofits and libraries at a much reduced cost for really great and not very used uh, equipment. So these are some of the programs, some of the newer programs that people uh, are that we're highlighting here, FileMaker. It's a discount program, not a donation. So they discount it substantially for our audience. And then I mentioned earlier Horizon Data Sys, which is an alternative to Deep Freeze. So if you're looking for something that can help um, restore and kind of wipe your public computers in between users, this might be a good opportunity or a good option for you. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on that, and we can walk through the process of how to request. And so here on this page you see a little description of what it is. You can see information about the restrictions and eligibility. And then as I scroll down I can see the products that they make available. And so they make available a donated product and also a discounted product. And to know the difference between the two, they may be the exact same products, but the, the admin fee may be different. And so that's where looking at the eligibility and restrictions can help answer like Oh, so this one is $40 admin fee. Maybe the discounted one is, I'm not sure what, but whatever that difference is may mean that it's an organizational budget thing or it's the size of, uh, of the organization. So that's where you can find that information. And so we'll look at this assuming that we'd be eligible for the donation of this. And we want the five user licenses donated to offer system restore software for my Windows-based PCs in my library. And so I'll go ahead and click on that to view the details. I can see that it's available, that this is a download. So again, I mentioned earlier, it's not likely that you're going to get a boxed 
product with a disk in it to put into your disk drive on your computer because most new computers don't have disk drives. So just be aware of the format that you are requesting uh, so you know to look for an email that tells you your request has been fulfilled. Follow these links to get access to the licenses and download your product. Um, so you can look at this and you can see, okay, I've requested quantity 1. Maybe I need 5 of these. So this is where I'd want to look at the eligibility and restrictions to see, can I request more than one? And over here you can see an organization may receive one of each donated product and any number of discounted products within a fiscal year. So that could be the answer to the discount versus donation. So maybe I can get one set of 5 licenses donated, and if I have a bank of 10 computers, then maybe I need to request one at a discounted rate as well. And then I've got my 10, 10 computers covered. So I would recommend really looking at these tabs, looking at the description, what it includes, what the capabilities are. Oftentimes you know, it's the same content that it, they might have on their website, um, and so it might link you to their site to give you some details. Um, that looks like there's a downloaded trial version that you can play with. So these are things that I think are really useful just to spend the time noodling through to make sure that it's a good fit for you before you dive in. And you know, one thing that's great about our community is that people love sharing information and they love sharing their experiences. So you can always go to our community, post in our forums, and say, hey, has anybody used this rollback RxPC? What was your experience? And you can ask and get feedback before you invest your time and public funds <laughs> and your resources and your staff um, effort into rolling it out. You can also do a quick search up here in our search box. You can always search for any topic and see what comes up. And you'll find sometimes webinars, sometimes articles, sometimes community forum, sometimes blog posts. So you know, there's a lot of ways to do some research about the products, particularly for the ones you may not already know about or may not have a lot of experience with. So here you can look at the system requirements, and again that rules and eligibility. I'm going to go ahead and add one to my cart, assuming I'm eligible, which you know, I'm logged in as a crime prevention nonprofit, so I'm not actually logged in as a library at the moment. Um, and now I can see that my products in my cart went up to 7 items instead of 6, and the, the admin fees changed. Um, I'd love to have Tommy come on for a couple of minutes and just talk a little bit about um, the admin fees and what, how those kind of come to be and answer that question that I know is probably out there for many of you. Sure, Becky, I'll be happy to. Um, you know, the admin fees specifically, um, what we do is just basically take a small admin fee. You know, the, these products, as you can see on a retail basis, are a lot more expensive. And as a nonprofit ourselves, you know, the, the admin fees are really how we, we run, how we're able to stay in business, have these webinars, uh, have employees to help you, and have a qualification team. So we usually do them in a range of you know, 5 to 10% the product's value is, is really what the admin fee is. So for that small 5 to 10% admin fee, you of course get all of our services, webinars, programs. Um, really everything that TechSoup offers is through these admin fees. So you know, it certainly is a win-win situation for everyone because we can continue to do this work based on those admin fees. You know, so uh, I think that would be a good explanation of you know why they're offered. You know, so uh, and uh, feel free, folks, if you want to continue asking questions in in the chat room, we're we're open to those. Um, you know, one question I, I just to change gears a little bit, Becky, if we can, is um, I find most libraries registering is difficult for them because often because we're dealing with nonprofits a library automatically will try to register themselves as a 501c3 library. It's probably the most common uh, error that happens. So uh, if you are a public library and you are listed on the IMLS database, okay, then you want to make sure when you register that you register as a non-501c3 library 
because a lot of folks end up registering and then just picking 501c3. And then if you try to put in an IMLS number, it's going to say this is incorrect because it thinks you're a 501c3 uh, organization. And certainly if you are a 501c3 library, you'll find a lot of them on the East Coast because those libraries are very old. And before there was that library system, libraries were nonprofit organizations. So a lot of those East Coast libraries are still nonprofits. And I'm finding them popping up a lot in other uh, states now too, like Texas. Texas is uh, sort of developing these nonprofit libraries, which is really exciting that they're doing that. So I just wanted to sort of shout that out to everybody to get their qualification process faster and more efficiently. Make sure that if you are in the IMLS database, you register as a non-501c3 library. So hopefully that tip will help everyone. Okay? Great. Thanks for that, Tommy. And you know, we mentioned 501c3 libraries, friends of libraries that are C3s, and public libraries. If you are a tribal library, an educational library, uh, or like affiliated with an educational institution like a university or a K-12 school or you are an academic library, you may not be eligible for donations directly through our programs. You may. So we certainly encourage you to sign up and see if it works. But many of these donor partners uh, Microsoft is an example here since I have Office Professional in my cart. Um, they have programs for their donations that are directly to schools and directly to academic institutions. So you may need to go through those programs which aren't facilitated by TechSoup in order to access those donations. So you know, while we encourage you to sign up and use all the resources that we make available, whether you are affiliated with an organization or not, we you know, hope to Share, share widely all of the information and webinars and resources that we create. Um, just know that you may have a different avenue to take to find some of these donations directly through those donor partners. So just wanted to put that out there as well. So looking at my cart, I have placed in here, again I had some items in before, five licenses of Office Professional Plus 2013, one three user license of QuickBooks Premier Editions, which is now, like I mentioned, open to public libraries, and one five user license or five user licenses of donated rollback, which is the Horizon Data Sys uh, program to help me roll back between users. So I'm going to go ahead through this process and you can see here up at the top that when requesting donations it outlines the steps for you at the top. And so I know I'm at this step number one, viewing my cart. And I'm going to move on to restrictions check, then agreements, then shipping and delivery, review and payment, and confirmation. I won't make it through all of these steps because I'm not going to actually put any payment information in because this is a fake organization and I don't want to tie up any donation requests that could be accessed by somebody else with my request. So at this point, the restrictions check will tell me, it says, do you see flagged items in your cart? And so as I scroll down, Unless I, if it looks like this, it looks the same as it did before, and it shows that it's available, then I can proceed. If something in my cart is something that I'm not eligible for, or I've exceeded the number of licenses I could request, um, it would flag it for me here. And it would tell me, sorry, nope, you've requested two of these, and you're only able to request one each year. Or it would tell me that you've already met your license limit for Microsoft donations or it would tell me you're just not eligible. <laughs> so this is where you want to just make sure that there's nothing that's been flagged because this is where you'd need to remove it from your cart. And if you run into this and you think you should be eligible and you've read through the restrictions and you just can't figure out why it's blocking you from getting it, then that's the time when you want to go ahead and email or call our client services department and they can help you figure out if it's an org type issue or if you've met that limit or if you have requested too many of something, they can help you figure that out. So I'm going to go ahead and proceed with the donation request. And here it asks me to accept some agreements. And now each of our donor partners will often have their own agreement language, but most of it is pretty standard language around, you know, I agree that 
when I receive this donation that I will not use it to discriminate uh, in hiring practices or housing or you know it's kind of standard standard discrimination verbiage that we would see on any kind of housing agreement or employment agreement. Um, you know, and then you may also see a request like this one that I'm a, I'm willing and able to demonstrate that my organization has acted in accordance with these guidelines. So if for some reason you got a request to say, hey, we want to know how you've used this for your public computers, it might be you having to email back to say, yeah, it's been great. Actually, here's a picture of my public computer bank. Um, it rarely happens, and usually when it does, it's a voluntary request to, hey, share your story or share your success. But you know, you're agreeing by checking these boxes off that you agree to the terms of the donation. And you'll see rollback RxPC doesn't actually have anything other than, yes, I understand this administrative fee is not refundable. Um, check those off and then proceed with the donation request. Now shipping and delivery. So this is a little tricky here just because some of the products in our donation program like uh, RCI products, the refurbished computers, laptops, monitors, tablets, those will obviously actually be in a box and ship to you and arrive at your door at some point. And so that's where you'll want to make sure you're checking off your shipping method and ground shipping, no additional charge. If you're only getting donations of software or services that would be online, then you are still going to have the option of ground shipping or some other kind of shipping method, and just leave it at that. We have that there because sometimes there are orders that are donation requests that have mixed physical products and online products, and so it is always going to be there. And unless you need it more quickly and you want to pay something additional for shipping, you don't have to even mess with it. But the one key thing I want to make sure that people know here is that when I mentioned that you join TechSoup as an individual, your organization has an email address that's associated with the organization. And that's probably separate from jane at DuluthLibrary.gov. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention and somebody's reading the email address associated with your organization's account. So with your library, it might be a webmaster at Duluth Library. It might be an info at whatever it is. You want to make sure that you have somebody watching that email address for your fulfillment emails because that's where you're going to get information about your license keys, information about um, login info if you get any online services like you request a ReadyTalk account so you can do online trainings. Well, that's where you're going to get the email that says, here's how to log in, here's how to set up your account. So be sure to pay attention to that. It asks you just to confirm the shipping name so you can attention it to somebody else. For example, if you're requesting donations on behalf of your whole branch of libraries and you want it to go to a different person, definitely go ahead and put their name there. Then we can go ahead and proceed with our donation request. And at this point, it wants me to review that yes, this all looks correct, and add my payment information. So here I'm going to stop, but this is where I would put in my credit card info or check info. Now if you're doing a check and um, you want to process that, just know that your donation won't be sent until that check is received and processed, which is pretty standard with a COD type system. So. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to bounce us out unless – you know what, let me have Tommy let me know if there are any questions that you want us – of people asking to show specific things on the site before I bounce off the site. Um, and then I can go ahead and take us back out for Q&A. Great. Thanks, Becky. Um, it seems like most of the questions are really uh, more driven uh, right now on registering and differences between 501c3 and non-501c3. There's a little confusion too on the IMLS number, which is your um, your FSCS number. Okay, and that can be found. I did post it in there. Uh, somebody had asked that question, but you can go to harvester.gov. That is where that is located if you're looking for that number. Uh, someone uh, had a very interesting question about a church library uh, or a religious org library. And uh, that can be a tricky question because does the library itself hold the 501c3? Or is it the, say, church's library 
and the church holds the 501c3. So in that case, the church or religious org would register themselves not as a library, but just as a 501c3. It wouldn't be eligible, unfortunately. Okay, but uh, that, that seemed to be the two big ones. But uh, I've answered uh, all the questions, and uh, I think that uh, uh, it was a very informative uh, session. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. Well, and on that church uh, question, so if you go to register and you find yourself torn between, you know, maybe you do leadership development and you do housing outreach and you do, um, you know, youth programs, and they're all part of your overarching library or your branch or your community center that happens to have a library or whatever it may be, what we ask people when they select their their um, organization type is to really look at the overarching primary theme or primary mission that you work toward. Um, when you do that eligibility quiz that I showed you earlier, it's a great opportunity to walk through it and select one and see what the results are, and select the other and see what the results are. If they're both really, you know, if maybe your organization does two things, really legitimately splits its time between these two different areas, I would definitely take the time to do the eligibility quiz twice and see which one gives you the greatest access to the donations that you need for your programs. Um, you know, we're acting in good faith in negotiating with these donor partners and telling them that you know, they, they trust that we're vetting organizations to ensure that the, the appropriate organizations of the appropriate budgets that they set for their their granting criteria are receiving the donations. And we're, we're putting that good faith in your hands too, that you're going to put the form forth that has the information that's accurate and that you're um, you know, serving your community with the, the donations that you receive. So we are, you know, we understand if you're serving your community and you do it in a couple of different ways that you may have a couple of different categories that could equally fit your organization's type. So take a little bit of time in doing that. And if you are already registered and you think you are not in the correct category, um, and you think maybe you registered your organization as a 501c3 library when you really are a public IMLS listed library, well that's when you can get in touch with somebody like Tommy and he'll help categorize you over again so that you can access the donations that are appropriate for your organization. So I took myself to the registration page here to sign up just to show as an example. And you can see it's a pretty basic form. Uh, this is me signing up as an individual to start. Like I mentioned, that's the first step in this process is joining as an individual. So I'll enter my TechSoup email address. So now you'll all know how to get in touch with me after the event. And I'll create a password and confirm it. And I'll give myself a new member name. And the member name is your own username that you would use um, to identify yourself in you know, a blog post or in a forum thread. Um, and then a security question. This is pretty standard to keep things secure. And we do ask these types of questions because once you're in our system, you may be doing credit card transactions. You may be requesting donations and signing those agreements and approvals for different donations. So we do try to make this as secure as possible. And you can see up here at the top in our URL that once you go into these forums, you're in a locked HTTPS site. So we're doing our part to keep things secure, and we hope that you'll put security questions and logins and passwords that will keep your data secure as well. So I will uh, create my own security question. There you go. You all know my childhood nickname. And this gives me the opportunity to sign up for these different newsletters. And since I'm a library today, I'm going to say, heck yeah, I want TechSoup for Libraries newsletter. I agree to the terms, and then it asks me to ensure that I'm human and no basic math, which is sometimes a challenge for me as a human. And then I go ahead and sign up for TechSoup. And it's given me an error because I probably have used this email address too many times. But you can see it's a pretty straightforward form. Um, oops, it's asking me for a password again. Sorry about that.
and confirm my email address. And we'll pop out in just a minute and do some wrap up here. See if it will let me. No, it's still not going to let me advance. Sorry. I think I've used my, um, my member names too many times. Well, as you can see, it should be a pretty easy process if you haven't done this process 20 times like I have for test purposes. So we're back at TechSoup.org. I'm going to go ahead and bounce us back out. But before I do so, I'd also like to just point out TechSoupGlobal.org is our uh, we are all part of TechSoup Global, so TechSoup.org, TechSoup for Libraries. If you want to learn more about the variety of different programs we have around the world, uh, local chapters where you can meet up with tech, um, tech inclined social gooders like in our NetSquared communities around the world, you can do that here, and a variety of other programs that we run. You can find that at TechSoup.org. Again, TechSoup for Libraries which is our library specific website. I'm going to move this little toolbar over here. And oh, I don't know what I did with it. I had um, also opened up our – where did it go? Oops, I guess I lost it. I had also opened up our YouTube channel just to show you that we have a playlist of past webinars that we've archived that are very uh, tailored just to our library programs. So you can see those at our TechSoup Video YouTube channel. And it looks like all of the questions that were in the queue have been answered. So I would invite you all to join us in our community forums if you have any questions at TechSoup.org slash community. That's where you can share your expertise, post your questions, answer other people's questions, and just the long list of resources of websites that we've shown. TechSoup.org, TechSoup for Libraries, TechSoup.org slash Libraries is that page on our site um, where you can get the eligibility quiz. And then lastly, I'd like to invite you to join us for other upcoming webinars. So next week I mentioned we're going to have a webinar same time next Thursday on Symantec's Norton Security products. The, they are new to our catalog, and it's a new way that they're distributing them and a new bundle of products that they're including. So if you want to learn more about their security rollout, you can do that. And then on January 21st, we have a webinar on engaging volunteers as tech trainers in public libraries. So each month, look for at least one webinar that's going to have a very specific library focus. And then on the 22nd, you'll see we have a webinar on making grants research simple. So if you are a library that writes grants um, and grant proposals, and you need to research where to get those funds, this would be a great event for you to attend. Then on January 29th we'll be talking about how to do technology planning for the new year that we're in. So with that, I would love to thank everybody for joining us today. I really appreciate all of your great questions on the back end. And I'd like to thank Tommy and Ginny for doing such an admirable job in answering all of them so we didn't have any verbal Q&A today, and Allie for helping manage the chat questions as well. Lastly, I'd like to thank our webinar sponsor ReadyTalk for providing the use of this platform for us to present these webinars on a regular basis. You can look at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk to learn more about using this program in your own work. Please take a moment to complete the post-event survey. It will pop up when you close out of this webinar, and it will help us to continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you so much everyone, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.